Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Farmer Greg here, and welcome to the 367th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together to educate and inspire you to become part of your food revolution. Hey, Urban Farm Podcast listeners, we want to know what you think about our podcast. You've been listening to me for almost three years now, and I want to hear from you. I have some very specific questions, including what you like about our podcast and where we should be going next. The important part is, I really want your opinion. I'm looking to connect with 50 listeners from no more than 10 minutes who are willing to share your thoughts. It's simple to sign up. Go to urbanfarm.org and look at the top menu. Sign up there. I look forward to chatting. I have said it many times, I am a lifelong learner, and I am excited to let you know about a unique global online event made just for those of us who want to grow our own food. In this four-day online learning opportunity, a collection of visionary growers, gardeners, permaculturists, and homesteaders share garden hacks, slow tools, gadgets, and gardening technologies. Join tens of thousands of budding growers and learn how to save time, energy, and money while doing what you love most, growing your own food and medicine. Visit urbanfarm.org forward slash garden hacked to register for this free online summit. Today on our podcast, we have someone who is bringing permaculture education to city dwellers. We're talking with Amy Strauss about growing food in the suburbs. Amy is a permaculture gardener, writer, educator, and author of The Suburban Microfarm with a varied background in home scale food production. As a permaculture designer, she specializes in ecologically regenerative and productive landscapes. Her own front yard landscape is a thriving example, catching water from the roof and growing a variety of edible crops. Her current adventure is to transform a three-acre property into a micro farm with her husband and mischievous farm cat. She reaches hundreds of thousands of people with her expertise and adventures in small-scale permaculture gardening on her popular website, tenthacrefarm.com. Her new book, The Suburban Microfarm, Modern Solutions for Busy People, is published through Twisted Creek Press and distributed by our friends at Chelsea Green Publishing. Welcome to the show today, Amy. Are you ready to rock the microfarm? Yes, I am. Awesome. So I shared a bit about you. Can you fill in the blanks for us and share more about the path you took to get where you're at today? Yeah, sure. When I think about my past, it really has a lot to do with learning to follow my nose. As cliche as it sounds, you know, my story starts with my childhood. My parents were really into sports. And so I grew up working really hard to be a great athlete. I was a soccer player through high school and college. And the values of hard work and discipline were, you know, really ingrained in me. That was something that I really, you know, was expected to do well. And I went to college. I studied to be a high school Spanish teacher. When I got into my career, about a handful of years into it, I realized that this career wasn't actually for me. And I hadn't ever actually asked the question, what am I passionate about? What makes me come alive? I had always just done, you know, what I was supposed to do. And that was, you know, work hard at the thing that was right in front of you. And so I found myself as a high school teacher, and I felt like this wasn't a very good match for my personality. At the same time, I had discovered that I had some autoimmune conditions that I was dealing with. And so between the stress of not feeling matched with my career and the physical health problems that I was dealing with, I decided to give my notice. I, you know, finished the school year and then I, you know, took the summer to really figure out what I might do next. And I knew that that included something about improving my health in some way. So of course, for me, when I think about improving my health, the first thing I think about is my diet and how I can improve that. So I joined the CSA and I was getting a weekly share of organic produce from a local farm. And I thought this was, you know, an incredible experience. It really made me want to dive in and learn more about how our food is grown. You know, as a consumer, 
I knew that it was important to support local farmers and to, you know, eat healthy food. But I had never considered that I might actually try being the one to grow these things. So I started helping out around the CSA. I eventually joined the administrative team to help distribute this food for 100 families. Wow. Yeah, that was an incredible experience, just navigating the behind the scenes effort that it takes to feed that many people. So I just kept following my nose, actually. This was a point in my life where I said, I have no idea what's going to happen next in my life. And so I have to be open to my intuition, to what's telling me to move forward. And so I started taking some gardening classes locally. I got a job as a landscape gardener, which was an incredible experience. I was learning how to design landscapes, especially ecologically friendly ones, you know, edible landscapes, native and pollinator friendly landscapes. And I was just in the zone. I couldn't get enough of having my hands in the dirt. I was bringing plants home from work and tinkering in my own yard to make it more eco-friendly. We disconnected the downspouts from our house and I created rain gardens and installed rain barrels and replaced regular old bushes with, you know, edible shrubs. I couldn't get enough of any of this. It was the first time that this passion was really coming out of me. And it was at this time that I learned about permaculture. And I didn't know exactly what that word meant at the time. But something about what I was hearing about this word permaculture was telling me that this was a next step for me. And there was a certification course being taught locally. So naturally, I signed up for that. Nice. <laughs> and that was kind of the beginning of me really doing this as the thing that I do, managing and designing super productive landscapes and having my hands in the dirt as the thing that I do. And around this time, I started writing a blog. I started a blog and I started writing about the kinds of things I was experiencing in my yard. I didn't really anticipate anybody reading it. It was actually, as I was writing it, I imagined speaking to my family members because everyone seemed to be kind kind of concerned that I had quit my career to, you know, play in the dirt and grow carrots is kind of one thing that I heard at a time. And I thought, you know, I wonder if I start this blog and I start writing about my experiences, I wonder if they'll understand what I'm going through. Well, that didn't really work. <laughs> it worked on one level because the blog is quite popular, correct? Yes. You know, that's exactly right. When I discovered that there were actually people out there who were really interested and the types of things that I was writing about, it confirmed for me that I was on the right track because I'm passionate about this. I've discovered that not only do I love growing things, but that I have a passion for writing about them and that people are interested in reading what I've been writing. And so it kind of morphed into this second career that I hadn't anticipated going into it. And that's kind of the beginning of writing the book, actually, The Suburban Microfarm. It was just kind of this natural extension of, wow, people are really reading what I'm writing and and I have this intuition of the things that I'm writing are things that I want to learn more about or get better at. And it seems like people are finding that that's helpful for them as well. And it was kind of this mutual energy. I was getting energy from, you know, helping others and they were giving energy back by saying, hey, this is something we're interested in. Right. When one of the things I really want to acknowledge you for is your willingness to not stay in something you didn't love. You know, so many people out there in the world are doing something until they get to where they get to do something they're loving, if that makes sense. And you just didn't put up with your life the way it was. You made it different. You took action, even in the face of your family, not agreeing. So I just want to acknowledge you for that. Good job. I feel so blessed that I had this experience of following my nose and learning to trust intuition. I think so often we doubt what our intuition is telling us because there are so many messages around us telling us what we should be doing. And so often we stay in this path of, you know, we should ourselves. <laughs> You've probably heard that term before. <laughs> oh, yes. So, well, congratulations. I'm proud of you for stepping out. You know, it's a lesson for us all to look at our lives and say, you know what, I'm going to go out and do what I love. So you discovered permaculture somewhere around 
around 2009, correct? Yes. Tell me, what is your definition of permaculture? My definition of permaculture is designing landscapes that work with nature. Very simple. We could get more detailed, but I think that for me, what permaculture did for me was help me have a relationship with nature, with ecological systems, learning to work with that in my garden. So for example, when a weed pops up, learning to not react to that as if it's a negative thing, but to say, why might that be there? What might its purpose be? And if I don't particularly want it there, what can I do to speed up the process of how that wild herb or weed is helping this particular situation? So yeah, I think very simply, I like to, in my mind, think of permaculture as a way to design with nature. Beautiful. And in permaculture, we talk a lot about regenerative and I am not a great big fan of the word sustainable, although I think it has served its purpose, but sustainable simply sustains the mess we've gotten ourselves into. And I believe that regenerative is the next step. Can you say a little bit about, because you used it in your bio, talk about regenerative and what that means to you. Yeah, I think that's a really great observation. I definitely agree with it. I think that when we are working with nature and we're having this back and forth relationship in our garden, when we're learning to read what nature is saying, when we look and see what's there and have a relationship and work with nature. But I think that the word regenerative implies that we are improving on what's there. And so when we're starting with a degraded piece of property, such as a lawn, you know, perhaps it was a construction site when the house was built and and they brought in fill and then we just seeded grass over that fill and now we have this lawn that's kind of a terrible <laughs> poor soil experience. And we don't want to sustain that. We want to regenerate new life into that and create an ecological situation that perpetuates itself all on its own. And so I think that's what we're doing when we regenerate ecosystems through our gardening practices. Beautiful. So you actually design residential landscape spaces. And I hear you get some arguments for why residential spaces aren't good place for food gardens gardens, what might that be? There are all kinds of arguments that can come up. For one thing, we can think about how we need a certain amount of space. You know, I was actually in this camp when I started learning about growing food over 10 years ago. I had this little tenth of an acre lot of land in the suburbs, but through my work on the CSA farm, my original teaching in about food growing was that you needed a lot of space to grow food or it's not worth it. Right. So I actually joined a land share. This is something I read about on the internet. It's called a land share project where you kind of lease land from a land owner and you grow food on it and your payment is sharing a portion of the harvest. And there's this whole legal document you can download from the internet to have both parties sign so that everybody is getting what they want out of the arrangement. So I did this for a summer. I drove back and forth between, you know, my house and this property further out from the city. After the summer was over, I discovered that I could have actually grown the same amount of food in my own little tenth of an acre if I had only learned to use my small space more efficiently. So that's one argument that I get, which is I don't have enough space. And another argument that I get is that farming is ugly. For a lot of us who live in residential spaces, especially people who aren't into growing food, they are really concerned about what your food producing activities are going to do to what your landscape is going to look like and whether or not that's going to be aesthetically pleasing. And a lot of people are really concerned about, you know, keep up with the Joneses kind of thing. If we really don't want to make this giant statement in a neighborhood of folks who are really interested in the manicured lawn look, you don't want to be the one who's standing out. But I actually think that we can find ways around this. And this is something I've taken a lot of time to consider 
in my writing and in my own tenth of an acre yard. I had a lot of neighbors who were very outspoken, actually, to tell me that they were concerned about my food growing efforts. So I wanted to make sure that those relationships worked. Uh So I found ways to grow food that enhanced the yard and made it seem like it was just a typical landscape. And I mentioned this earlier, but one of the first things I did was, you know, replace that typical old hedge that is in front of my front porch. I replaced that with a hedge of currant bushes. Nice. You know, I didn't know if it was going to work, but I figured, hey, you know, everybody's okay with a hedge in front of their front porch. So I don't think it matters what kind of shrub I'm growing, as long as I'm growing something that is, you know, the same type of plant structure that they're used to seeing. So it turned out to be wonderful. I didn't know if it would work because that area is in the shade most of the year. But those current bushes produce about, I'd say, 10 pounds of berries, 15 pounds of berries a year. I'm sure that they would have produced more if they were in the sun, but from an area that had not been giving back, so to speak, in any way, now it was giving something back to me. Yeah. So I think that's incredible. I think we can get around some of these arguments for sure. You know, my big thing is plant something that's edible or supports edibles and make it look pretty, especially in the front yard. You can do whatever you want in the backyard, but if you're growing food in your front yard, make it look pretty. And we can do that with edibles. Yes, we can. Absolutely. So I'm looking at your book, The Suburban Micro Farm. Tell me about it. The book really came out of my own personal experience and what I learned along the way of starting this whole journey of growing food as an adult. I hadn't you know, grown anything as a child, so I started as an adult and I kind of wrote about the experiences that I had along the way of figuring out how to do that. Number one in that whole mess of learning how to grow food is actually as an adult, we have to be a little bit efficient about it because we're all busy. Mm -hmm. As I sort of took this on as a second career, as a professional consultant, I'm designing landscapes and I'm now starting to write articles for magazines and other professional outlets. And I'm starting to speak in my community and I'm running a community garden project and I'm doing all of these things. And suddenly all of these wonderful experiences I was having in my own yard, they were still producing joy But I was realizing, you know, now I have this kind of, in quotes, job, and I've got to figure out how to do this efficiently. So, you know, some of the strategies that helped me manage my time, I thought that this is something that probably other people would want to learn about. I wrote a lot about that in the book. For me, figuring out your schedule is sort of this lifestyle design piece that we don't often talk about. We just want to talk about the fun things about growing. And so I put that into sort of the beginning of the book. Like, let's set this up so that we have time in our life to do this, that we're managing a food growing space that appropriate for the time we can give it and that we're not beating ourselves up for what we can't get to. Yeah, that's a big piece of it. Don't beat yourself up for what you can't get to. That's right. We want this to be fun and enjoyable because this is why we're doing it. So yeah, all of those things went into the book. And then the other big piece that I wanted to make sure was in the book. So we're shifting our expectations about our lifestyle and our time management and how much time we can spend in the garden, even if we want to spend all of our time there. We also have to shift our expectations when it comes to the types of areas that we're gardening with. And I wanted to address these challenges. So, you know, a lot of us have small spaces, sloping land, shade, poor soil. You know, these are the kinds of barriers that some people get tripped up on and we're not able to get past that and enjoy what we're doing in our yards because we start having these failures and we don't know how to respond to that. So in the book, I really wanted to give suggestions for dealing with a lot of those challenges. And I'll just give you an example of something that I was dealing with in my yard that kind of sparked, you know, wanting to write about this. My backyard of my original 10th acre farm, it had been a swimming pool before we bought the house. And before the house was 
sold the previous owners, filled in the swimming pool with poor construction fill. Uh-huh. So when I went to you know dig in the backyard, I'm finding giant chunks of blue painted concrete. Uh-huh. They were so large that I wouldn't have been able to pick them up without machinery. And this area was also sloping. It was a small space. There was shade and half the backyard was a driveway. When we talk about barriers as far as growing, boy, did I have some barriers. Yeah, no kidding. It was interesting that my first experience growing on my own land was this challenging backyard. But I figured out some ways around that. One of the things I did was I built raised beds on a portion of that back driveway that we weren't using. So right on top of the blacktop, we had looked into getting it removed, but it turns out that blacktop can actually be quite toxic to the soil if you disturb it. Right. It's better to just kind of build on top of that. So we built pretty tall raised beds and soon enough, I was growing a lot of stuff in there. Now I had to choose shade loving things to grow. So leafy greens, lots of herbs and flowers, root vegetables as well. And before I knew it, we were producing about 80 to 100 pounds of produce from those raised beds. And that's not a ton of production, but when you think about the barriers we're dealing with, it was actually pretty good and it was definitely a step up. Oh yeah. You know, then we also observed the backyard that actually had grass on it. We kind of observed those sun pockets watching the sun as it went across the sky and looked for those areas of lighter dappled shade as opposed to deep shade. And then we created these planting pockets. So when we connect with our space and, you know, really spend some time and observe, I think what we can do is we can have a can-do attitude about it. We can say, okay, I could complain about what I don't have. I don't have a lot of space. I don't have a lot of sun. I've got these challenges. But what can I do? What's one step I can take to move forward? So this is the type of thing that I really wanted to cover in the book. Another thing is I cover a lot of permaculture. I call them tools in the toolbox. So managing water wisely, using herbs as fertilizer, planting food forests, I have all of these little tools that I put into my chapter on permaculture that I really hold close to my heart. Excellent. So I'm going to shift on you and I'd like for you to talk about a time you failed, how you overcame that failure and what you learned from it. Yes, I can think of so many different times that I, in quotes, failed. And what I realized is that each time I failed, it was an incredible opportunity for learning. Mm -hmm. An example I can think about is I wanted to start a community garden in my community. I felt like, you know, growing food is something that I really enjoy doing. This is a community that I am new to. And if I found other people who were doing what I love to do, you know, maybe I can make some new friends. And I was living in a township. So we're a few miles out of the urban city, but there is no town center in the township. There's no community. There's not a civic center. Mm -hmm. There's not really a downtown of any kind. And so I thought, I don't even know, first of all, where I would have a community garden, or even if I wanted to host a meeting and invite people to come to talk about the possibility, I don't even know where I would have that meeting. So there was a senior center down the street. I thought they might allow me to use one of their meeting spaces, but they said no. I went to the library and they said, if you're not an established organization, you can't use our meeting room. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I thought that was strange from a library. I felt like I had failed at this, you know, opportunity. We have a small university in our township that I hadn't really considered connecting with because first of all, I didn't have any direct connections with. I wouldn't know who on campus to call. And they're a little bit further out. So really it wouldn't get much visibility from the community. So I didn't even think about it. Well, last resort, I thought I'm going to give them a call. And I ended up hosting a meeting and about 30 to 40 people showed up. Wow. And I thought this was great for a suburban community where folks who want to garden probably already have a backyard garden. So 
And then our next step was, okay, great. There are people interested in gardening. Where are we going to garden? Well, I talked to the parks and recs department of the township. I looked at private spaces. Nothing was really working and the township kind of didn't want to have their hands in this. And finally, the university said, hey, we have a space for you. And I jumped for joy. I was so excited. A group of us went to look at this space they were giving us. And it turns out the space they're giving us is this steep hillside that is really an unstable area filled with tires and weeds back in the woods, no easy access and completely out of view from anybody who might try to find it. Oh my gosh. So again, I felt like I had failed. I uh-huh. can't find a meeting space. I can't find, you know, community garden property. And finally we get this space and it's nothing like we would want for a community garden. At that point, a sane person would have said, I'm going to chalk this up as a failure and just keep moving. But I'm very stubborn and I decided to take that wasted space they were giving us and turn it into a community food forest. So instead of having rectangular raised beds on a flat, sunny area that people can garden, we decided to restore this hillside and grow some, you know, perennial fruits and herbs and things that would, you know, not require a whole lot of disturbance to the soil, right? but would give us something back in return. And it was grueling work. The project lasted for about five years until I moved out of the township. But during that time was very special. Actually, instead of growing food, because all of the food we were starting to plant, you know, took years to get going. We always said our motto for the community garden was we grow more community than we do food. Right. Every week getting together as a group and doing this grueling work is a great way to bond together. We started having potlucks. We started hosting community events. And suddenly we had created this culture around producing food and regenerating land, you know, and the food was this secondary byproduct that wasn't necessary to keep us going. So you could look at it as a failure, but I kind of look at it as this experience of learning to shift expectations and learning to be flexible. Wow, that is epic. Good job. What do you consider your biggest success? Let's see. That's a hard one. I think if I had to just off the top of my head, I would say that quitting my career as a teacher was probably my biggest success. It started as me thinking of myself as a failure. You know, why can't I just do this job and be happy. (laughs) But I started following my nose, as I said in the beginning, and following my tuition and doing it anyway. So this whole following my nose into growing food and having my hands in the dirt and writing about it and speaking, I started pushing through that doubt and criticism that I should just be doing what I should be doing. Yeah. And I started doing it anyway, doing this growing food and doing all of these things. And the richness and the joy that I have in my life from, you know, pushing through that doubt is directly connected to my stubbornness. <laughs> so follow my intuition. Sometimes I think stubbornness can be an asset. Yeah. So what drives you? Well, if you can't tell, I would say that I have a slight tinge of perfectionism that drives me. (laughs) Right. Besides that, I would say that my passion for showing examples of what's possible is really what drives me. And I'll give you an example. At my original, you know, 10th acre suburban property, I was working in my front yard. And this was after I took my permaculture design course. And I was learning about, you know, creating these integrated designs. So I created this design where I was capturing the water from the roof into to a swale, which is sort of a tool that we use often in permaculture for collecting water, you know, in the ground. Mm -hmm. And surrounding this swale and rain garden, I had created this beautiful edible landscape that turned out amazing and super productive. And it was beautiful, everything that I could have wanted out of a front yard garden. But the first thing we had to do was dig in the dirt and create ditches everywhere. And we did this in 
late winter when nothing is growing and all of my neighbors were so concerned. What are you doing there? Yeah, they were so worried. Yeah. I had one particular neighbor, I could give you countless examples, but one particular neighbor who became decidedly unfriendly because he really appreciated people who valued their lawn and took care of their lawn space and he didn't see what we were up to and I tried explaining it but you know he didn't have the same vision in his head that I did all he saw were the ditches and piles of dirt everywhere that were in front of him but Later that summer, everything was in full bloom. The swale system was working perfectly, and it was really beautiful. And this particular neighbor came over, and, you know, he was kind of humble about it and said, well, you know, I didn't believe you, but this is really looking amazing, and, you know, can I have a tour to learn more? Nice! Yeah, and I kind of explained, again, what we were up to, but this time I had things to point to and a sort of visible demonstration. And he was so excited about the idea that he offered me a portion of his yard to expand my growing operation into. (laughs) That's what I call epic right there. That is cool. This is what we're after. We're after to transform people's opinions about their lawns. Yeah, exactly. And we have a lot of opportunity to shift opinions and assumptions when we can physically demonstrate and physically give examples of what we're up to. We can show pictures, we can give tours. And so this is what drives me, being able to show these examples that help people transform you know, what their original assumptions are. Well, good job on that one. So if you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be and why? I could list so many books about growing food that have been transformative for me, but I wanted to actually talk about a book that isn't in that category. And it's more about the mindset of shifting our life to be what we want it to be. And this book is called Wherever You Go, There You Are. And this is a book by John Mm Kabat-Zinn. And it's mindfulness meditation in everyday life. And I know some people can be tripped up by the mention of the word meditation, and it's not a religious experience. But The reason why I wanted to talk about this book is because as a person who loves tinkering in my garden and learning new things and applying those new things to my food producing systems, I'm always working toward, you know, being a better person and having a better garden and seeing where things are wrong. Yeah. Over here, there's a weed or I should redesign this garden or you know, that space just isn't right. And the carrots didn't grow as well as I thought. And we're constantly taking notes about what didn't work. Now, of course, we also have those joyful experiences, but I think we can get caught in this mindset where we're constantly taking notes about what isn't working and what isn't done. So I started this practice of mindfulness meditation, which basically means that you're taking some time every moment to sit and be still and to not take stock of all the things that are on the to-do list or all of the things that aren't done, but you're taking stock of what is working, what you are grateful for, what is really amazing about your life and your situation. And, you know, I can think back to my moments you know, directly after quitting teaching where this practice was harder (laughs) because I felt like I had a steeper hill to climb. But still, I think in any moment, if we can remember what is amazing about our life and what we can be grateful for, I think that's important. And this book, it just has these short excerpts that you can read on a daily basis that are kind of parables and kind of teach you through a story about just being mindful and grateful in the moment. I had a great big smile on my face over here. I have that book. And when I met my partner, Heidi, and we combined our libraries, we both had a copy of that book. Oh, that's wonderful. (laughs) Love it. Love it. Love it. So what one final piece of advice do you have for our listeners? One piece of advice. If I could just give one, I would say take stock 
of your accomplishments. And this kind of builds on what I was saying about the book that I recommend. But I think a lot of times we forget how far we've come. So I think as gardeners, one thing, this is just one way you could do this, is to learn to remember to take photos often so that you can remember what things looked like before you started a particular garden project or learn what kinds of harvests you were getting or how beautiful the flowers were. Because I think when we can remember what we've accomplished and it helps us through those moments where our brains are kind of stuck in this moment of what isn't working what's there to do still what am I not getting to so take stock of your accomplishments and one of the things that came up for me with this idea is way back about 10 years ago when I was working my landscape gardening job my boss required us at the end of every job let's say we were working on a landscape redesign at a residential property in somebody's front yard, for example. And we would spend every day during the week working on that project and Friday would come and we would complete the job. Well, we were required. This is actually a requirement she had for us. Before we could do anything else, we had to look at our job well done and give ourselves and plot ourselves. We had to give ourselves an ovation, so to speak. Wow. And I thought that that was a really cool thing to do because you are remembering to stop and appreciate all of this hard work you just did. So give yourself an applause. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for joining us on the show today, Amy. Yeah, this has been fun, Greg. Thank you for having me. You bet. And how can our listeners get a hold of you? Well, you can find me at tentsacrefarm.com. And what I did was I set up a special page for the listeners here. So if you go to tentsacrefarm.com slash urban farm, uh-huh. you're going to find all kinds of resources that you can click on depending on what's interesting to you. I've got a free 19 page guide to organic soil amendments that you can download if you want to become a subscriber of my weekly newsletter. And basically this 19 page soil guide kind of tells you all about the different organic soil amendments that are out there in the world because you read about a lot of them. And this guide will help you determine which ones are going to be right for your specific conditions. Oh, nice. So yeah, that's one thing you can get. I've also got a link to my book on that page. Perfect. The Suburban Microfarm. And then I'm also involved in teaching an online permaculture design course, which I'm really excited about. And this is a self-paced course that you can, you know, sign up for and do at your own pace. So I've got a link to that on the page. And then I've also got a link to, you know, all of the social media. So you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, Twitter, whatever your preferred method is. So I'm 10 Acre Farm. You can find me on all of those, but you can also link directly from them if you go to this special page, 10 acrefarmcom slash urban farm. Awesome. You can also find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash 10th acre farm we are your urban farming resource you can find our podcast on itunes google play stitcher and iHeartRadio. also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles podcasts webinars courses and more well that's it for today thanks for joining us on the urban farm podcast hey urban farm podcast listeners we want to know what you think about our podcast you've been listening to me for almost three years now and i want to hear from you I have some very specific questions, including what you like about our podcast and where we should be going next. The important part is I really want your opinion. I'm looking to connect with 50 listeners from no more than 10 minutes who are willing to share your thoughts. It's simple to sign up. Go to urbanfarm.org and look at the top menu. Sign up there. I look forward to chatting. I have said it many times, I am a lifelong learner, and I am excited to let you know about a unique global online event made just for those of us who want to grow our own food. In this four-day online learning opportunity, a collection of visionary growers, gardeners, permaculturists, and homesteaders share garden hacks, slow tools, gadgets, and gardening technologies. Join tens of thousands of budding growers and learn how to save time, energy, and money while doing what you love most, growing your own food and medicine. Visit urbanfarm.org forward slash garden hacked to register for this free online summit. 
We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.